there, I'm CBS 8's Jenny Day. So glad to have you with me as I take you around San Diego. I'll catch you up on what you may have missed and look ahead at what's to come. Top story by far this week though, the Padres. Ahead of the big playoff weekend, we checked in with local bars and restaurants about the economic impact their success is having. CBS 8's Abby Alford shows how the gas lamp is getting ready for you. Don't worry if you don't have tickets inside Petco Park. You can still come down to the gas lamp where businesses say they are ready to rock. The gas lamp may be a bit gloomy today, but come tomorrow. Being born and raised here in San Diego and always being a huge Padres fan, it's absolutely incredible. Padre fans like Jude Milton will light up downtown. To have something so big for the city after such a long time against the Dodgers nonetheless. Jude will be whipping up some fan favorites in the morning at Spill the Beans on Market. Would you like that black? Would you like a little bit of room in it? He was just a kid the last time fans filled the stands for a Padre playoff game. It's the last time with my uncle and grandpa against the Cardinals, having the opportunity to check them out as a youngster, and now all these years later, have the opportunity to see him again. It's very exciting. Next door at the Smoking Gun Bar and Restaurant. Won't be able to move in here at all. Um, come tomorrow night and Saturday entirely, uh, the pre-party and then during the game and after the game when we win, uh, it's going to be very, very, very crowded in here. Owner Randy Wagner says the Padres also helped businesses make it to the postseason. It basically takes a an typical October and makes it a July for a gas lamp. Record crowds usually come in July for Comic Con. San Diego police say that it's expecting 100,000 people inside and outside Petco Park this weekend. Smoking Gun says it will double its staff. Yeah, we've told the staff all hands on deck uh, a couple weeks ago and we we're kind of anticipating this. Steps away from Petco Park's K Street gate. Um, right here is our pulled pork. Cochinita Pibil Taco. City Tacos is sizzling up unique and authentic street tacos. And it's a pulled lamb. Co-owner Israel Montano says the taco shop will be a fryer frenzy. And when a boss hit, you can still hear it inside, you know? So it's definitely a good time. A good option for fans who don't want to drop a lot of dough on tickets but still feel the postseason Padre passion. It's about as good as it gets, to be honest with you. You can head down to the gas lamp, come to City Taco, fill your tummy, and still cheer on the pods. I call that winning, Alex. Cheers. Cheers. And did you catch when he said, when we win? I like that. And right in the middle of one of the best Padres games we ever watched, a surprise guest appearance in the eighth inning that had everyone flocking to social media. A goose took the field, and as CBS 8's Kirsten Holmes found out, the dreaded Dodgers were stuck between a goose and a hard place. It was the foul scene round the world after a goose got loose at the Padres-Dodgers game last night, and the crowd, well, they went quackers. We thought we saw everything in the game, and now a new friend wants to join our party. We went straight to the goose. Padres Hall of Famer Rich Goose, but heard he was out hunting. So we settled on I'm this guy from the L.A. Hunting. Autobahn because he's a bird <laughs> expert. A species is a greater white-fronted uh, goose and that breeds up in Alaska and then migrates all the way down to the Central Valley of California, uh, hangs out a little bit there, and then some of them migrate down to Mexico. So the goose took a gander at the 5-3 Padres-Dodgers playoff game on his way to Mexico. Is that gonna be the, the, the rally duck, rally foul? Ah, 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 goose, possibly looking for a bandwagon. Can geese be baseball fans or no? <laughs> No, they're not really baseball fans. So before the Dodgers goose was cooked, this foul gave everybody goosebumps. The crowd is going quackers. This is an intense playoff game. We're having a blast calling it, but I cannot help but laugh at this moment. And made a run. I mean, fly for it because this Lucy Goosey still has a trip to make south of the border. It's hard to know what's in a goose's mind or any bird's mind, but if you can imagine trying to fly from light into pitch darkness because your eyes get adapted to the light and then it's very dark everywhere else. The crowd didn't take kindly to the goose's removal. The Dodgers confirm it was safely released, but if you're looking for calls to speak foul language for the next Padres game, you have time. There's baseball playoffs in October and birds migrating in October. Our fine feathered friend ushered in a big win for the Padres and they're going to take on the Dodgers right here at Petco Park. We're all out of goose funds for you. Friday at 537. I'm Kirsten Holmes getting goosey with it for CBSA. 
made me laugh. Kirsten, thanks. And tickets behind home plate for Friday's game were going for close to five grand. The Padres' big wins are making for some long lines at an East County coffee shop. Joe Musgrove's parents own Cafe Adesso on Tavern Road in Alpine, not far from El Cajon, where the star pitcher grew up. CBS 8's Shannon Handy has more on the excitement and how far people traveled for a cup of Joe. I talked to people who drove all the way from the South Bay just to have coffee here at Cafe Adesso in Alpine. One of the most popular items on the menu is the 44 in honor of number 44, Joe Musgrove. Hi there. Mondays are typically busy at Cafe Adesso in Alpine, especially today following the Padres win over the New York Mets Sunday night. Oh, yes, this is very busy. They're asking about the Padres and see if we watch the game, and, you know, they're just really excited about everything. Go Padres! This family drove up for National City decked out in Padres gear. Absolutely. We have to support our boy Joe. And they weren't the only ones. Especially after what happened yesterday, we got to show our support for Joe Joe. This woman lives in Chula Vista. Her excitement for the Padres is what brought her here, saying watching Joe Musgrove and the rest of the team advance in the playoffs is a feeling like no other. I'm a season ticket holder. I've got my tickets ready and I'm so excited. Called my dad, was like, Dad, we're going. So it was a lot of fun, especially sitting next to some Dodger fans. And they're excited too, though, because then they get to come here and we get to stomp them at home. Throughout the morning, the walk up line was just as long as the drive through, and no one appeared to complain. It's always worth the wait. It's amazing coffee, it tastes great, and uh, we're happy to support. Joe Musgrove grew up in nearby El Cajon. His parents have owned Cafe Adesso for about 20 years, but you only find one picture of him posted on the wall inside. If you're lucky, you may catch him in person. Does Joe come around? Every once in a while you get a sighting, <laughs> so it's kind of fun every once in a while you show up and he's here. Employee Melissa Martinez says you're more likely to see Joe's mom, who's here a couple times a week. Comes in, makes coffee, talks to the customers. She's really fun. As for that number 44 drink people like, it's pretty tasty. The 44 is our vanilla half and half and cold brew. Though it's not just the coffee people come for, it's the pride they have for a hometown kid who is not only making his own dreams come true, but is doing the same for an entire fan base. Just hearing El Cajon being mentioned on a national ESPN ball game broadcast and, you know, bringing a lot of pride to El Cajon. We're proud of Joe Musgrove and everything he's done for the city and the Padres. In Alpine. He left, came back, and he's happy here, and he's breaking records and making history back home. So it's super exciting to have that here. Shannon Handy, CBS 8. We are proud. Joe and I both went to Grossmont High School. We are all rooting for you, Friars. Well, early voting is now underway for the November election. Nearly 2 million registered voters in San Diego County received their ballots in the mail this week. You can drop off your ballot in the mail or at one of the 141 new ballot drop boxes across the county. Anti-theft mechanism, so there's no way to to put your arm down this, this slot. It only fits the envelope itself. Yeah, if you want to vote in person, you can now head to the registrar's office in Kearney Mesa Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And local and national leaders met Wednesday to tackle the critical lack of affordable child care in San Diego County. During the pandemic, hundreds of child care centers shut down. Many have never reopened. But voters in the city of San Diego have a chance to help fix the child care crisis. CBS 8's Richard Allen explains how Measure H would use city parks to increase child care access and lower costs. Well, that's right. More than 40 city owned rec centers like this one here in North Park could potentially offer child care. But currently under the city charter, city parkland cannot be used for that purpose. Measure H, though, on the November ballot aims to change that. Normal Heights mom Danielle Knauf is a strong supporter of this idea, which would use parts of rec centers and other city-owned spots as child care centers. I think that it's, it's something that should have been done from the first. A recent study from the San Diego Foundation finds that on average, the annual cost of care for one infant in a licensed child care center in San Diego is over $19,000 increasing to more than $33,000 for two children. As we've seen so many families having to either choose between going back to work or staying home and taking care of their kids because childcare is just so expensive. San Diego City Council Member Raul Campillo says if voters pass Measure H this November, the city would then have the authority to use rec centers for childcare. 
We can then explore with child care providers, with contractors, what those changes would be, what the investments would be, so that we can finally provide those slots. Campillo says increasing the number of child care options would mean more competition among centers, which could then bring down costs. For Claremont resident Talisha Davis, the high cost of child care forced her to make the decision to give up the possibility of a day job. And I stay at home with my kids because of that. She and her husband, whose kids are now two and six years old, support the move to use city rec centers for child care, as long as they also continue providing the other services they offer the community. Previously, the price of daycare consumed a huge part of their monthly budget. Where we were, we were paying about the same amount in rent as we were in childcare. What would be the point of going to work if I'm just paying for them to go to daycare? So that's why I stay at home. It shouldn't be a punishment to have children. They're amazing, but you also should be able to afford it. And in order to pass this November, Measure H has to receive 50% plus one vote. For more information, just go to CBS8.com and click on the help button. Richard, thanks. And as the city tries to dig itself out of a housing crisis, it is now seeing a major drop in affordable housing permits. While construction of market rate housing is booming, CBS 8 is working for you and found new units for lower income are far less than those making more money. Abby Alford explains the concerns and how they're being addressed. We're at the future home of Midway Rising. The city says it'll be a multi-use development that will include affordable housing for low to moderate income households. But what does that really mean? And why did we find such a dramatic disproportionate number of affordable housing for those who can't afford much compared to middle class? Single mother of two, Margarita Diaz, has not had any luck finding affordable housing. Since January of this year, for 10 months, she's been searching for an apartment on her $53,000 annual income for a family of three. She's considered very low income. I, I have never been late on my rent payments. I've been a good tenant. We went to Parisa Ijani Maksudi, who's a civil rights attorney and specializes in affordable housing, to explain what is affordable housing. So what affordable housing means is housing that is affordable to your income bracket. The California Department of Housing data shows from 2020 to 2021, there was a major drop in affordable housing applications in San Diego for struggling families. Last year, only 9% of all units were slated for very low and low income, compared to the 90% for a single person who makes above the moderate income, which is someone who makes about 128000 a year. We know housing is being built. We see housing being built. But what the numbers show is we are not mandating and enforcing the inclusionary provisions that we could adopt and enforce to require the building of income for all housing. The city has a history of trying to build new homes. The mayor says he's focusing on building affordable homes through initiatives and a statement he wrote, since I took office in December 2020, my administration has unveiled a long list of initiatives that will make it easier and faster to put a roof over the head of every San Diegan at a price they can afford. Talk is cheap. When we talk about affordable housing, we should be talking about, we must be talking about those who are low income. These are individuals who are single moms like Margarita who live paycheck to paycheck. I mean, literally our, our checks are going to, to bills and, and rent. For more information and an in-depth look and interactive map on where affordable housing is being built in San Diego, go to CBS8.com and click on this story. Abby, thank you. In meantime, new data shows more students at San Diego Unified School District are struggling compared to students before the pandemic. According to the district, the number of students who are either meeting or exceeding California standards in English has declined by 4% since 2019. In math, that number has gone down by 7.4%. The district's deputy superintendent says it's time to adopt a new mindset when reviewing test scores and remember, the scores are a snapshot of unprecedented times. Well, a San Diego State student spoke out this week about an assignment that involved acting out a slave persona. A student posted his discomfort to Instagram, and it went viral, many calling for the tenured professor to be fired. CBS 8's Abby Alford also spoke to a community activist who believes that is not the answer. 
Some San Diego State students taking African Studies 101 here at Storm Hall are outraged after one of their professors required them to act out a slave persona as part of an assignment. This is the viral Instagram posted by San Diego State student Amari Jackson. On Monday, he posted an assignment from his African Studies professor, Lachey Sharp Collins. In the caption, he writes, should never have to act like and create a slave persona for one of my Africana study classes. But hey, at least my professor canceled the in-class presentation where she wanted us to act and dress in our personas. Neither Amari nor the professor have responded to our request for an on-camera interview. SDSU's statement only confirms the assignment and that the presentation portion has been canceled. Commenters have called for Collins' resignation, calling the assignment triggering and insensitive, while others have come to the teacher's defense. The African Study Union released a statement saying that Collins has been with SDSU for over 20 years and met with students and staff to resolve and clarify the issue, writing, we as students know that Professor Collins would never do anything to harm students Students and is committed to ensuring that every student is heard and respected inside and outside of the classroom. We've come to understand that the discipline of Africana Studies is built upon the community experience and healing around it. I think that the Black Student Union is actually teaching us how to make progress. Tasha Williamson is a community activist referring to the African Student Union. She knows Collins but hasn't spoken to her about this issue. She says she's being treated unfairly compared to a white SDSU professor who came under fire for using derogatory language. It's difficult to be a black woman today in America. Williamson understands the trauma this may have caused students and praises the African Student Union on how they are addressing the concerns with both the professor and students. Now we need to learn about how we come together as a black community and how we handle when even someone who is black in our community has harmed people in that community. We followed up with San Diego State to see if this professor has taught this lesson before with no issues and if she would be disciplined or under review. They said that they would not comment any further. We will keep you updated for any developments. Abby, thanks again. Well, fentanyl awareness education will now be required in San Diego classrooms. The San Diego County Board of Supervisors unanimously approved the proposal on Tuesday. Parents and students will also be given naloxone, the life-saving nasal spray that can rapidly reverse opioid overdoses and be trained on how to use that medication. Well, this week also marked one year since that small plane crashed into a Santee neighborhood. It killed the pilot and a UPS driver and injured an elderly couple. The NTSB is still investigating what caused that crash. On Tuesday, neighbors held a moment of silence for the UPS driver. Steve Kruger and UPS trucks lined the streets. The two most severely damaged homes are still undergoing repairs. Well, Governor Gavin Newsom is giving the green light to digital license plates. He just signed a bill that makes them available to all drivers if you have the money for it. CBS 8's Regina Urita shows us how the digital plates will work. The digital plates are meant to make the DMV process smoother by allowing drivers to renew their registration without having to step foot inside a DMV. A benefit not just for drivers, but staff too. If you're a vehicle owner in California, then you've probably been to the DMV and you've probably experienced those long lines that sometimes take hours. It's going to be a horrible day because I'm going to the DMV. I don't want to go. <laughs> I do not want to go. That's just something I don't like doing. A new law in California is making it possible for all state drivers to trick out their whips with digital license plates. According to the state, the bill signed by Governor Newsom will establish an entity that will issue alternatives to stickers, tabs, license plates, and registration cards for vehicles in the state. For the past few years, the digital plates were tested by California drivers under a pilot program, with the plates being produced by the Bay Area company Reviver. Simplifying registration. That's what we were looking to do. It's just simplify the registration process. Neville Boston is the CEO and inventor of these digital plates. He says there are two models, battery powered and wired, but it also comes at a cost. Drivers have the option to pay $25 a month or an annual fee of $275. And it seems like some Californians are willing to pay for it. 
I would definitely pay for that. And I also own a transportation company. So yeah, I mean, that is like a win-win. Tommy Rizai is one of the first testers and says he aims to connect in today's high-tech world. I'm an early adopter with a lot of things, and I thought, hey, why not? Let's uh, give this a shot. I thought it was cool. Drivers will also be able to display different emergency messages, for example, if there is an amber alert. There's also a built-in GPS and could tell police if the car is stolen, but that tracking technology also brings up questions of privacy. Assembly member Lori Wilson, who co-authored the bill, says drivers with concerns of privacy will be able to disable the tracking feature on their personal vehicle. Regina Yurita, CBS 8. Interesting. Regina, thanks. Well, a group of local leaders called on Customs and Border Protection Wednesday to cancel plans to replace the border fence there at Friendship Park. CBP wants to replace the fence with the new 30-foot border walls. The group against that idea has asked for input from the community. Several letters are now headed to Congress in an effort to stop the proposal from going forward. Well, a record number of unsheltered San Diego residents have died in the past two years. Dozens of people gathered outside of the county administration building on Monday to honor those lives on World Homeless Day. CBS 8's Richard Allen digs into the process to help people experiencing homelessness and the actions some advocates are calling for. Well, that's right. East Luminaria behind me represents a life lost on the streets here of San Diego. 500 homeless people died in 2021, almost a 50% increase from the year before that. We pray for a future where no one dies on our streets without dignity. At this remembrance of those homeless who have lost their lives for World Homeless Day, prayer combined with powerful calls to action. We need real change, we need real legislation, and we need our homeless siblings off the streets. An increasing number of those unsheltered on our streets are senior citizens who are often the most vulnerable. We are seeing far too many people experiencing homelessness, far too many aging who have done their service to this community and to our nation. CBS 8 spoke today with Mayor Todd Gloria on what's being done to combat this crisis. We've added 38 percent more beds in our city in just the two years that I've been mayor. I need the other cities in this county making similar concerted efforts. Homeless advocates who came out tonight say bolder steps need to be taken. We've got to treat this like any other disaster, which is to provide immediate aid and relief to the victim. Martha Sullivan of the San Diego Housing Emergency Alliance is pushing for local leaders to use the city-owned Mission Bay RV Resort as an emergency campground. That's 500 households could safely stay there in their tent or in a, their vehicle. They're readily available for housing placement. Last week, San Diego police once again started enforcing an ordinance mandating homeless San Diegans take down their tents from public right-of-ways during the daytime. Uh, there are reasons why we have to act to make sure that there's basic health and safety measures taken during the day to ensure that there's a basic level of sanitation and cleanliness. But at the end of the day, homes solve homelessness. Shelters don't solve homelessness. Arresting people for uh, having an encampment doesn't solve homelessness. Homes solve homelessness. And for some local resources to combat homelessness, just go to cbsa.com and click on the help button. Thank you, Richard. Well, protests in Iran are targeting the country's economic lifeline, oil and gas production. For the first time, oil and gas workers are joining the protests erupting from 22-year-old Masa Amini's death. Despite higher danger from government security forces, protests are now in their fourth week. A human rights group says at least 185 protesters have been killed. Well, San Diego County opened its first ever welcome center for immigrants and refugees in National City. The director of the center says it was strategically placed there because of the city's historic support of the immigrant, immigrant and refugee community. The center offers a wide range of services and resources from legal help to community activities and events. Today, this Welcome Center is going to make sure that uh, the contributions that they make to our communities continue and, and that they feel safe and that they have the resources that they need. Do, we do have a full list of those resources available at the Welcome Center on CBS8.com.
Well, as we continue to mark Hispanic Heritage Month, we're highlighting Corazón de Vida, a nonprofit that provides life-saving services for abandoned children south of the border. CBS 8's Rocio de la Fe has more on the work that also gets done on the U.S. side to help give those the organization serves a better future. Corazón de Vida not only helps transform the lives of so many children and young adults, but their work is felt on both sides of the border. Corazón de Vida, a nonprofit organization in Baja, Mexico, is focusing on helping so many who come from broken backgrounds find their voice in society. Voices like Karen Areli, who came to the orphanage as a young girl. She tells me, that's when my life changed. I had clothes, I had people to play with, I had friends, I was eating well. It was a completely different childhood than what I had before. Like Karen, hundreds of other children and adults have gone through the same doors for the chance of having a better future. The organization's focus is to provide basic needs such as food, a home, education, and medical care. Board member George Perez says it's not an easy task. Finding the consistent support to provide the basic needs for the homes, uh, food, um, utilities, you know, the everyday costs that a family t takes for gr granted, multiply that by 10 times, and that is what the need is in these homes. Corazón de Vida stores have been open for nearly 30 years. It now has more than 10 orphanages with more than $16 million in aid raised to date, and volunteers and donors who give the children the chance at life. And it all started because of founder Hilda Pacheco Taylor's own experience of growing up in a similar environment. So. For me, having gone through that, having received the support of so many generous people and feeling so um, thankful that I was provided that support, that it led me to try to provide the support for children um, that were in the orphanages and initially started with trying to help the orphanage where I was raised. Everything the organization does is thanks to the generous donations that are mainly raised in Los Angeles, San Diego, and Orange counties. It takes a lot of effort from a lot of people standing by our side. The nonprofit takes in children as young as one year of age and helps them until they complete their studies. In Karen's case, who's now a student, the nonprofit is helping her get through university. With the help, Karen is now set to graduate in December as an industrial engineer and says without the unconditional support of the organization and the donors that make all of this possible, she wouldn't be in the position that she's in. She says now we're someone different and we can have our own testimony so that other children and other people can become someone in life and have a future. Pacheco Taylor says there are countless of success stories just like Godin and says seeing the children become responsible adults makes every challenge and sacrifice worth it. It's it's an amazing feeling. It actually it makes us feel so proud and feel validated in the work that we do um, in knowing that we're changing a child's life when we see, you know, someone that we met when they were five or six or seven years old that came from a really difficult background grow up in an orphanage and then we see them on to college become a professional and serve their community it just it's amazing the nonprofit is hosting their noche de gala or gala event night coming up in november to help raise funds that go directly to helping the children that they serve for more information or to find out how you can donate visit our website cbs8.com Rocio, thanks. Well, the Caesar salad is world famous and can be found in just about any restaurant. But who invented the Caesar salad? To find out, we had our resident foodie, Sean Stiles, go in search of the origin of the Caesar salad. And the best answer may be closer than you think. It is a discussion that's been going on for decades, nearly a century. Where did the Caesar salad come from? Well, we're here in Tijuana at Caesar's restaurant to answer that question. Gracias. Caesar's restaurant first opened in the early 1920s and is now located on Avenida Revolución in Tijuana, Mexico. For me, for us, we feel very proud of this uh, creation, this recipe, because it was made here in, in Tijuana, so 
it's, it's a Mexican dish. Since then, Caesars has had many owners, but 12 years ago, Javier Placencia and his family took over the reins and returned Caesars to its glory days. We still have a lot of the original menus, a lot of photographs, the espresso machines, the cashier. We have still have some, some of those elements. The restaurant feels very, very like if you're in Chicago, kind of, you know, that vibe. It has a sense of authenticity. Very authentic. During Prohibition, it quickly became the place to be for those north of the border looking for eat and drink. The original owner, Cesar Cardini, was from Italy and had restaurants north and south of the border. But it was actually his chef that invented the Caesar salad. After a shift uh, at the restaurant, uh, Livio Santini was preparing the Caesar salad for him to eat. A guest saw Santini making the salad and asked if he could make it for her and her friends. The next thing you know, Caesar Cardini is doing it table side. And that's what we're about to do. To get the exact recipe for the real Caesar salad, we have Efrain Montoya yeah. and Javier. You're going to be my coach, right? I'm going to be your coach. Because this guy is an ace, right? He's been making Caesar salad for 20 plus years, so. OK, I need you in my it. corner. Let's get going. So we're going to do anchovies, of course. French ground Fresh, garlic, yes. About a half teaspoon. Dijon mustard. Mm -hmm. What do we? Uh, like that, it's fine. Is that good? Yeah, sure. Great. Okay. I love Dijon. I don't yes, I do too. I, I think it's wonderful. Worcestershire. I cannot uh, pronounce which, it. OK. <laughs> like that. That's like good. That? Yeah. Uh, Black right. pepper. Oh, yeah, this. With style, with style, come on. Oh, with style. Yeah, yeah I'm Sean Styles. I got to do it with style. A little bit more. I like a lot of pepper. Then this the hard part. The hard part. Here the we go. The tricky part. It's not hard, just tricky. It's not hard, it's just tricky. But you work in restaurants in San Diego. Yeah, so yeah, you, yeah. You, yeah. You, know, That's, you know. Okay, here we go. All right, there you we go. You can do it. Here you go. Here you go. There you go. That's good. That's, That's good. good. There wow. you go. All right. And I noticed that you guys use limes. We use limes because we have amazing uh, Mexican limes here. So we're going to put the juice on top of the yolk so it kind of gets a little bit of a uh, coach. Watch what okay. he does. See. OK. So you can kind of press, press ah, the anchovies. Yep, get it so it's a yeah. nice sauce yeah. there. I'll say that. So now, so, OK. You oh, wanna, you're, you're going to do I'll that. I'll help you. So okay. you got to do it little by little. So okay. it's a blend of uh, light olive oil with a little bit of extra virgin. See, there we go. So it doesn't get too bitter. Watch the watch your rhythm. Oh, okay. Work with your oh. muñecas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Okay, my muñecas. I have got the maestro the, over here, right? The queso, the cheese, very important. Yeah, what cheese? Okay. Grated uh, parmesano reggiano. A little bit there of showmanship there. And then we mix yes, it around a little bit more. Yeah, I love the look. Don't over man you it. taste. Like, of course, you got to taste. What do you think? You want more it. cheese, more? Let's see there. His is more tangy. Should we put one more lime in? Let's put it a little bit more. There you go. Oh, that's totally the oh, difference. That's the difference. Now the lettuce, you want to keep it intact, whole, crispy. And there's plenty of dressing he in here. It. And I, now I notice. It's like a dance. We're not. <laughs> like a ballet. I see. Oh, yeah, folding them over. Once you put the lettuce on the plate, okay. put the plate here. here. Okay. Ah, nice it's little got a trick. Place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they little, look pretty. So yeah. it's got to, the food's got to look good to taste good, right? Of course. Okay. And I like to do a couple of croutons, not just one. I, me too. I'm, I love I'm all about croutons. So let's okay. Let's put them. I got the boss working for me right now. And I like a lot of cheese on mine. Okay. I don't know if you love. Smiling and with style. Yes. And, and then let's see. Let's see the difference. They look, they look pretty similar. Let's mm -hmm. try. Them. I'm gonna take a bite of mine. Oh, no, his is. You think so? Oh, Efron's is way better. Let's see. You gotta try that. Let's see. And that, that's better. You have to, it's better. Efron's well, is better. 20 plus years. Yeah, 20 plus years. And I've been off the uh, dining room floor for about that <laughs> long. Hey, this has been a great experience on cooking with styles. Javier, Efron, uh, if you'd like the recipe for the original Caesar salad, go to cbs8.com slash recipes. Muchas gracias, gentlemen. Thank you. We'll send it back to you. And how about that Caesar salad? Yum. Sean, thanks again. 
Well, ecotourism is growing in popularity. Here in San Diego County, there's a retreat where you can get in touch with nature and learn how to implement those green tips into your everyday life. Our chief meteorologist, Carlene Chavis, breaks down how you can live and vacation in an eco-friendly way. Uh, it's nice. You got the sun shining. It's really quiet out here. You'll often hear about people saying sustainable living, but what about sustainable vacationing? Here in the hillside of Ramona, we're going to show you how to do both. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> That's good. Like it? I would definitely say it's like a papaya. Yeah, it's like a papaya. And you know, you can oh, definitely really strain the seeds out and make an amazing margarita. Now you're speaking my language. Yes, Carissa, she is speaking my language on so many different levels. From hiking to yoga to tips on sustainable practices, Full Circle Farms has it all. Just look at this place. We are even eating a cactus fruit that was growing poolside at this eco-friendly retreat. And that's not all they're growing here. We're in between everything, but yeah, Flowers. we have so actually, this is a pomelo tree. So this is a baby pomelo. You'll also find white sage good for energizing and black sage good for calming growing here, which is forged for smudge sticks. Carissa stresses they only forage 20% to minimize the significant impact to the animals that thrive from eating the seeds. Additionally, pomegranates are amongst other vegetation sprouting up on this 21 acre retreat through sustainable practices like recycling fallen trees for mulch, low flow irrigation, and the use of composting natural material instead of using chemical rich fertilizers. So this is leftover food and um natural yes. products so rather than throwing them out we actually put them back into earth and they it breaks down and creates beautiful nutrient rich soil and um, we put that back on our fruit trees. Carissa also detailed other eco-friendly practices at Full Circle Farms including solar panels for power, solar heating for the pool and the use of high energy efficient light bulbs. All of which Carissa can help you to incorporate into your own lifestyle along with the use of environmentally safe products like this one. That's not a dryer sheet. What? That is your laundry detergent. Whoa, wait, oh, time out. Yes, <laughs> yes. Visually, I'm thinking that this I is know. a dryer sheet, but no. this is your laundry detergent? That's your laundry detergent. Oh my goodness. So you have turned those big giant bottles of laundry detergent into this natural, organic, non-toxic material that when you put in your wash, it just it goes into the water and cleans your clothes and disappears. Whew, I was shook. Wait until you visit and hear her other tips that won't break the bank either. And did I forget to mention, this is where you would stay? It brings the earth inside. I don't really know how else to describe it, but we have natural stone floors. Oh my goodness. And wood everywhere. You can smell the earth in here. It's just amazing. Amazing indeed. Full Circle Farms is not only gentle on our planet, it also promotes being kind to yourself. You can also treat yourself to spa services like massages and yoga classes with a little extra touch like this Himalayan sea salt wall, which is especially great for allergy sufferers like myself. So when we're doing our flow, it's we have a charged room with negative ions, clean, pure air. So if you're looking for a positive charge to your health, classes and tips for an eco-friendly lifestyle, a chance to reconnect with nature in a quiet corner in San Diego County, or all of the above, this green sanctuary in Ramona will do the trick. Coming to this property is rejuvenating and relaxing. So yes, we are organic, sustainable, healthy, and very relaxing. <laughs> and that's the magic of Full Circle Farms. Now you just have to come and find out for yourself. For CBS 8, I'm Chief Meteorologist Carlene Chavis. Yeah, truly uplifting. We all could use that. So beautiful, truly. Carlene, thanks. And to you, as always, thank you for your time. Thank you for staying informed. Hope you join me each week as I take you around San Diego. For CBS 8, I'm Jenny Day. Take good care of yourself. And again, go Padres.